Well, good morning. So I had something happen to me this week uh, about which some of you may be unaware. I had a birthday this week. And it's okay, you can still send me gifts. I'll take them late. It's not a big deal. Don't mind at all. But I was thinking about as I was writing this sermon and, and getting ready and, and having the birthday in the midst of it, that as you get older, uh, there are fewer and fewer options for you. When you're a kid, when people ask you what you want to be when you grow up, uh, you can say anything. You can say astronaut, you can say lawyer, doctor, pastor. And then when you get into middle school and you realize that, well, I can't really do algebra, much less any other kind of math, astronaut quickly falls off the list of things that you could possibly do. And then as you get older again, you realize you're not very detail-oriented, so lawyer and doctor aren't an option, and so you do wind up becoming a pastor. <laughs> but as you get older and you reach a certain age, your life begins to kind of be more of a train on a track kind of driven by the decisions that you've made in your youth and quickly approaching kind of less and less options to more and more things. I was cutting my grass the other day and I was thinking about how much I would enjoy being just for a summer, not for my life, but for a summer, like a part of the grounds crew at a baseball stadium and how much fun that would be and how much unfun that would be for my wife and the church when I was like, hey, I'm going to quit for a summer and go be, do grounds crew at the, at the Rangers ballpark or whatever. You just can't do that. Whereas in college, I might be able to do that. But in the midst of this, in the, in the course of your life kind of narrowing to this train on a track, you want to make the most of the days that you have ahead of you. You want to make the most of the life that you have left, of whatever this train is that you're on, you want to make the most of it. You want to wind up at the right des destination. And for many of us, the, the key to this is going to be living a life of wisdom, of biblical wisdom as you progress through the rest of your life. Now, one of the great things about living in the era that we live in now, we have tons of knowledge. My wife and I have this happen all the time where I'll be like, who was in that movie or who was in that show or, or what was this or where are we supposed to go? And she can just pull it up on her phone while I'm driving. I'm just, I'm just like, look it up. Like, I don't have to think about this. Just look it up. And it's awesome. We have all this information at our, at our fingertips. Maybe the most knowledgeable group of people who have ever lived. But do we have the most wisdom? Do we know what to do with that knowledge? Oftentimes we don't. And accompanied with this amassing of knowledge is sort of an arrogance that has come from our generations that we are better than generations that has preceded us. And I don't mean like millennials looking back on boomers and such. I mean our collective generations looking back on centuries past. And so I think one of the things that's gonna help us as we start this new series in the book of Proverbs, looking at the way of wisdom, I think it's gonna help us to see that there's ancient words, there's old words that can help us guide our future and guide our life. And it's important for us to approach this as we come out of our discussion about Galatians. We have freedom in Christ, that's what we learned in Galatians, and now Proverbs is going to tell us, now what do you do with that freedom? How do you live that life? We're gonna to be today in Proverbs chapter two, verses one to 15. And over the course of the next several weeks, what we're going to look at is, is uh, wisdom by topic. What, is, what does the Bible have to say about guidance? What does it have to say about anger? What does it have to say about these different things? But today, we need to spend some time answering some questions. Chiefly, what is wisdom? How do I get wisdom? What is its benefit? And then what makes it so hard to live a life of wisdom? So first, let's talk about what wisdom is and how to get it. And it's that wisdom is a gift. Wisdom is a gift. Proverbs chapter two, verse one says, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the, find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. One of the things we have to answer before we can move forward is what exactly is wisdom? And the Bible's answer to that is it's a gift. Wisdom is a gift. Look at verse six. For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. It's a gift. Now there are different brands of wisdom, right? Common sense 
is a kind of wisdom, and some of us lack said wisdom, and that's okay. Common sense is a kind of wisdom. Experience is a kind of wisdom. If somebody has been working in a job for 20, 30, or 40 years, they have more wisdom in that working world than somebody just out of college. Now, the person just out of college may not think that, but they do, typically. Typically, that's how that works. But biblical wisdom is sort of this unique subset of overall general wisdom. And we need to answer what that is. And it's summarized most often throughout Scripture as this thing called the fear of the Lord. It's a phrase that the Scriptures use very often. And I think it's one of the most misunderstood phrases. And something that helped me understand it this week was something that Bruce Waltke, who's an a, a Old Testament commentator, said is that the fear of the Lord, the mistake we make when trying to understand it is we break it into its composite parts. We take the Lord and we're like, okay, I know who God is. I, I kind of understand who he is. Great. And I know what fear means. That means to be afraid or to cower. And then we shove those things together and we think, oh, that just means to be afraid of God. And so we live this life cowering in fear, thinking God is this uh, uh, God who just kind of pushes his weight around and we're supposed to run and hide from him. But that's not what's happening here. You can't take fear of the Lord and separate it to understand it. It's like table salt. Salt is made by two poisonous chemical, poisonous atoms coming together, right? To make something that's delicious. And the, really the only way it's dangerous to you is if you have too high of a sodium diet. Guilty. Fear of the Lord is like that. It can't be broken into those parts. Bruce Waltke again says that to fear the Lord is both rational and it has an emotive complex. It, it has a, an emotional component to it. Fear of the Lord is to submit to his revealed will. And it helps us to know that the Bible uses the word fear of the Lord. It's not fear of God. So it's not fear of Elohim. It is the name of God. It is the name of the Lord. It is I am. It is Yahweh. And that gives us a clue because Yahweh is the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. Moses said, who are you? Who am I supposed to tell people you are? And he says, I am who I am. And the way the Hebrews ever since wrote the Lord so that they didn't write or speak the name Yahweh. They said, the Lord. So this tells us something about what it means to fear the Lord because the Lord, his name was given when the old covenant was handed down. When you think of Moses, you think about the law, you think about the 10 commandments. And so to submit to God, to submit to the Lord and his revealed will is to do so under the heading of the covenants. This is how God has said, I want you to interact with me. And praise God that we live under the new covenant, not the old covenant, but the new covenant. So there's a lot of components about that, a lot of working parts. But the best way to understand the new covenant is to look at Jesus' teachings and his ministry and his life and his death. And you see that to submit to God and his revealed will under the new covenant is to look at Jesus' life and his teachings. What did he say to do? Love God, love other people, and do it in a way that is sacrificial to you. That's what his life is. That's who he is. That's what he does. And so for us, to fear the Lord is to love God, love other people, and to do it in a way that costs us something. Do it sacrificially. Now, if you've noticed, if you've been in church a while, or maybe you haven't been, one of the arguments that people have against the Bible, and I would agree with it, I, I find this frustrating sometimes too, is that the Bible doesn't tell me how to live my life in every single category of life. The Bible doesn't tell me what is God-honoring internet use. Pretty sure scrolling through Facebook with most of my time is not God-honoring. Doesn't tell me what political party to vote for. It doesn't tell me whether cohabitation is right or wrong. People didn't live together back then like that. It seems like on the surface that that would be wise. You save money even though you're not married. And so what happens is, it doesn't seem to tell us how to live in portions of our lives, often how to make the most of our lives in some ways. But another Proverbs commentator says, this is exactly where Proverbs comes to the rescue. Derek Kidner says that there are details of character small enough 
to escape the mesh of the law and the broadsides of the prophets and yet decisive in personal dealings. Proverbs operates in this realm. So God's word tells us specific things, but there are some things that our life we run into and we're like, God's word doesn't have anything to say about this necessarily. And that's where wisdom, that's where Proverbs lands. It's kind of the safety net to keep you on the path following God. So if you want the Travis Cook 21st century definition of wisdom, I'm happy to give it to you. It is the God-given ability to navigate the gray areas of life in between God's revealed will and our experience in such a way that loves God, loves others, and makes the most of a person's life here on earth. I will say it again because it is wordy and long and that is an occupational hazard of being a pastor. The God-given ability to navigate the gray areas of life in between God's revealed will and society's laws or our experience in such a way that loves God, loves others, and makes the most of a person's life here on earth. That is what wisdom is under the new covenant, in my opinion. So how do we get this wisdom? How do we get a hold of it? This is where Proverbs helps us again. Really, there's two ways. There's a passive reception, and then there's an active reception, right? So let's talk about the passive verse first. Verse one of chapter two, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. This is a father speaking to his son and he starts by encouraging him basically to listen to him. The son is coming up against competing voices, much like the world we live in. Everybody wants your attention. Everybody wants you to listen to them. And the father's telling the son, look, you're going to listen to me above everybody else. He wants to give his son wisdom. And all he's asking his son to do is to listen. And it's, it's not just hearing it, it's actually storing it up. Notice what he says, treasure up my commandments with you. This means to hide away, to store it away for a special purpose. This father wants to give his son a trust fund of wisdom that he can draw on in difficult days. So he's supposed to store it up. He's supposed to keep it. On top of that, he notice he needs to adjust his heart and his ears so that he's more accepting of his father's teachings. Again, it's not something to be heard and discarded. The words of the father are meant to be received into the heart so that it transforms you. The difference between the words of God and the pithy sayings that we have on like cards and, and, and banners in our home, like eat, pray, and love, is that eat, pray, and love typically doesn't transform me. Other than the eat part, that one I've got down, pretty good. The praying and loving I'm still working on. But God's word is meant to transform you. It's meant to shape you and change you. And this is what he means when he says, uh, if you make your ear attentive and incline your heart to understanding. Inclining is like bending down. Think of, and I don't know why I thought of this, that you could be any animal drinking water from a pool, but I think of the giraffe, right? Who has to like spread its legs out and like bend its neck way down. We have to incline our heart after wisdom because your heart, because of sin, desires so much to bend after something. It wants something to guide it. It wants someone to tell it where to go. And so we have to incline it to the nourishing water that is God's word. But on top of that, we have an active way of receiving, an active way of receiving, not just passive, but active. Verse three, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Eventually, as you receive wisdom, you crave it more and more. Notice the active words being used here. Notice what he does. He calls out for it. He raises his voice. He looks for it like riches and treasures. Someone who understands the value of God's wisdom isn't satisfied with just getting it on an IV drip. You crave it. You want it, you search for it. And that's why it's like a gift. Some of us at one point in our life or another, you received a gift 
from a parent or a grandparent, maybe an aunt or an uncle, and it was a gift that introduced you to a hobby of theirs. Maybe you got a fishing rod from a parent that likes to fish, or you got a, a, a gun to go hunting with, or an art set to paint with, or something like that, baking set to bake with. And it wound up being more than just a gift. It began being an entree into a hobby. And now it's something you're passionate about. Now it's something you love and you cherish. And that gift became something that you sought out. You sought other ways to explore that hobby. That is what the gift of wisdom is like. God gives us this gift and we receive it passively. Oh, thank you, Lord. But then as you see it take root and plant in your life, you become excited. You become to thirst after it and desire it. And so this begs the question, do you ask God for wisdom? If it's a gift, do you ask him for it? James 1.5 says that if we lack wisdom, we can ask and God will give it generously. I think we often feel like God doesn't want us to ask for wisdom. We either take it for granted or we're like, oh, I should know this. I shouldn't bother God with this. This is so simple. No. God desires that we ask. He desires that we, we come to him and ask for help, ask for wisdom. Something that I've started doing recently, and I, I don't know where this came from, is that, that when I pray to God for wisdom, uh, I, I start with something like, Lord, I'm a child. If you have children or you're around children a lot, they make a lot of decisions. They are not always wise decisions. It's how they wind up with like knots on their head and bruises and things like that, you know. Don't run in socks. Shh. You know, there they go. As you get older, though, you, you make wiser decisions. We are like children when it comes to the wisdom of the Father. He knows what's right. He knows what's best. And so I often pray and I'll say, Lord, I'm like a child. I think this is what I should do. And I'll lay out my plans. I'll be like, Lord, I think I should do this and this. And this makes a lot of sense to me. But I don't know because you know things more than I do. Give me wisdom. And I don't think God sits there and is like, I can't wait till Travis finds out that that plan is a hot mess. No. I think when my child comes to me and tells me, Dad, can you help me do this or think of the best way to do this? I want to help her. And your God wants to help you too. This is going to sound cheesy or campy, but I think it's good to have a, 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 a solid application. And something that is as, as, as simple as this can get you in a habit of asking God for wisdom. Maybe take like Wednesday and call it Wisdom Wednesday. Okay, like I said, I know it's campy, but we're going with what we got. Wisdom Wednesday. And maybe you, you take a break from what you're reading in the scriptures and you read a proverb, a chapter of Proverbs that day. Or a chapter of Ecclesiastes or a chapter of Job. Something in the wisdom literature. And you pray like three times that day. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. And maybe pray for specific things you need wisdom. Again, it gets you in that habit of asking for something from God that we often take for granted, which is his wisdom. Because we would all agree that there's benefits to being wise. The problem is sometimes we don't ask for it and often we don't really know what the benefits are. So let's talk about the benefits. What good is wisdom anyway? Well, it's a guide. Wisdom is a guide. Verse 7 he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. Every good path. We all want to be called wise. Nobody wants to be called foolish. There's a benefit to wisdom. And one of the primary benefits to wisdom is this. The source of wisdom himself is God. And when you seek wisdom, you seek God. And you get to draw close to him and you get to know him in another way, another setting, another means of communication is that wisdom. And that's such a great blessing. But there are real practical blessings as well that can be given to you by pursuing wisdom. And there are two, protection and blessing. Let's talk about protection, verse seven. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. The father talks to the son about how wisdom's like this pathway, this roadway that you travel, and it's gonna guard you if you keep to it. Now, one of the things that we take for granted is that roadways in the ancient world were incredibly dangerous places. If you were on the highway in between two cities, you were exposed and at risk. And a lot of what I'm gonna tell you is largely about Roman roadways 
which is, comes way after these Proverbs were written. But if, as good as Roman roadways were, they were still very dangerous. And even back then when the Proverbs were written, they were even more dangerous. So we're going to kind of apply backwards here. But roadways were incredibly dangerous. There were whole sections that might be in control of a rebellious village or a town. Thieves, brigands could lie in wait. And people would travel. Hey, say you're moving from one city to another. Remember when Joseph has to take Jesus and Mary down to Egypt. They take everything they own and go. You could lose everything in one robbery. And there's no insurance. You could lose everything. That's what happens when the Good Samaritan finds the man. He's lost everything. We don't think about this either because we just often see roadkill on the side of the road, but there were wild animals that were lethal. Lions, bears, wolves, snakes. A one third century author, again, third century AD, so 300 years after Jesus was born, well after these Proverbs were written, talked about how Roman roadways were littered with the corpses of half eaten people because they had been attacked by wild animals. Flooding can wash out whole sections of the road. Frederick I, Barbarossa, which Barbarossa means red beard. You can call me Barbarossa if you want to. He drowned on his way to the Crusades, crossing a river because it was flooded and it was a bad roadway. That was in the Middle Ages. Roadways were incredibly dangerous. And if you got off of the roadway, if you got off of the path, if you tried to take a shortcut, you were even more exposed And one of the main jobs of the king was to keep the roadways open, to keep them safe so that commerce could happen, trade could take place. And you knew if you had a good king, a strong king, if you were safely, moderately safely traveling. But if there were sections of the road held by thieves, that wasn't a good king, it wasn't a strong king. Look what's said in verse 7, God is a shield, he guards paths, he watches over. God watches over and guards our pathways. Notice it says, watching over the ways of his saints. The people, the people of Israel would make pilgrimages to Jerusalem to make sacrifices. We're like pilgrims on the way. We just are just like them. We're going through life. We're on on a journey. And if we stick to God's roadways, if we stick to his path, this strong king, he's gonna open it up and he's gonna protect us and he's gonna watch over us. But we have to stick to his pathways. We've got to stick to his wisdom. We're often tempted to go into the wilds to take shortcuts to get ahead. As you know, one of my favorite books is The Lord of the Rings, and one of the most unwise of the hobbits is named Pippin. But Pippin has a great statement. He says, shortcuts make long delays. And he's right. Washington Irving in The Devil and Tom Walker says, like most shortcuts, it was an ill-chosen route. We've got to stick to the path. Because when we're protected, then we also receive blessing. Look at verse 9. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. I'm not going to spend too much time here because we're going to talk about guidance next week. But what do you think eternity will be like with Christ? What do you think the new heaven and earth will be like? Will it not be this? Isn't this what life is? Equity, righteousness, justice. Won't it be every path will be a good path with the Lord? It is blessing. This is what blessing is. And you can get tastes of it today in this life. You can have blessing. Very practical, realized blessing. That's the great thing about Proverbs. Often they'll tell you practical, real things you can do with your life. Sometimes our faith gets really abstract. Not Proverbs. It's incredibly grounded. Blessing and protection are there for you if you follow the path of wisdom. Now, some of you might say, well, Travis, that's not always the case. Sometimes people are wise and they're blessed and they still run into terrible things and they still lose their life and they still get cancer and they still get robbed and they still die. And this is where you have to take the entire counsel of scripture and the entire counsel of the wisdom literature in, key, in place. Because yes, Proverbs says, live this way and you will be blessed. And Ecclesiastes comes behind it and says, well, hold up. The same guy that wrote Proverbs wrote Ecclesiastes and he says, hold on. That's not always the case. Solomon's saying, I'm an older man now. I'm not satisfied, I'm not happy. I don't feel like I've made the most of my life. Wisdom, it seems like has failed me. And Job comes in after him and says, well, hold on. Job was a righteous man, he was a wise man. And he lived by wisdom and he lost everything. 
And Job's message is, even when it seems like God and his wisdom has failed, you stick with it. You keep going. Because God will redeem even the most dastardly of things, the most destructive things for our good and his glory. You just have to keep following the path. And here's the thing, and this is the thing that uh, Job reminds us of and Ecclesiastes reminds us of too. Being a wise person, living a life of wisdom is a challenge. And that's going to bring us to our third point. Wisdom is a grind. It is an absolute grind. Verse 10, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil. Men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. We just talked about how wisdom protects you. And you might say, well, protects you from what? And the Proverbs continually come back to two metaphorical antagonists of the sun. One is a group of evil men who want to lure them into following their ways. And another is an adulteress who seduces him. And what the father is saying is that the wisdom is a guide to avoiding these characters and these characters do not mean well at all. They, are for, they forsake the paths of uprightness. They delight in doing evil. <coughs> Excuse me. People in these categories, and I don't want to vilify people outside of the church, but you need to recognize that their understanding of wisdom is different than a follower of Christ. For them, our wisdom can often seem foolish because the gospel seems foolish. That's what 1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 25 is about. It's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's foolishness to the Greeks because the idea that somebody could die for us 2,000 years ago and have any bearing in our life seems ridiculous. And I know it sounds ridiculous. But that is where the wisdom of God comes in. And what's really difficult about the path of wisdom is not that one call to leave the path, it's not two calls to leave the path, it is a constant cacophony calls and cries to leave the path. It is a grind. It's constantly wearing on us. And we've all have left the path. We've all have abandoned the Father's wisdom at some point because it's an incessant call. It often feels like it's harder and harder and harder. And frankly, we're, it is hard for us to meet the challenge. It is impossible for us to meet the challenge of wise living on our own. But there's hope in this. Notice what it says in verse 1. Who's talking here? A father is addressing my son. All of us, like I said, have abandoned the paths of wisdom that our fathers have laid out for us. We've all disobeyed at some point what our parents have told us. I remember when I was in college, I had a friend uh, that had a lake house. His grandparents had a lake house. And we would go up there sometimes for spring break. And my dad was always worried about us going swimming because he was afraid we would drown. Fair enough. And he would told me as I was leaving, he'd look at me and he'd look me right in the eyes and he'd say, no lake. And I would say, right, Dad, got it. And then as I walked out, I patted my duffel bag that had three sets of swim trunks in it. And Dad, I'm sorry, you didn't know that. So you'll watch this later, and I apologize that I disobeyed you. But it made for a good sermon illustration. We have all disobeyed what our Father has said because we thought we didn't know what he was talking about. And we've done this with our Heavenly Father, too. We rejected him for all sorts of reasons, right? And so it leads us off the path. It leads us off the path of wisdom. And as desperately as you want to find your way back, you can't. But look what's said here. My son, if you receive my words, Jesus Christ is the son who obeys the words of the father. Jesus Christ is the one who hears the words of wisdom and he follows them. He keeps it perfectly. He is the wise son. He listened to the voice of his father. Look what's said in Isaiah chapter 11, verse one. It'll be on the screen for you. This is a messianic prophecy. About Jesus, it says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. That's David's dad. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And look what it says. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and what? And the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Jesus is the good son. He's the one who sticks to the path. And when they couldn't pull him off the path, when the evil men and the seductors couldn't get him off the path, they killed him. And God redeemed that life, redeemed that death to allow us to get back on the path 
if we will just cry out to him. If we'll cry out to God and say, Father, I don't know how to get back. Jesus, would you please bring me to the path of wisdom, to the path of life? Will you give me eternal life? I want to walk in your protection and in your blessing. Call me back. And if you do that with faith, guess what happens? A path opens up to the pathway of wisdom, and it's shaped like a cross. And you just walk right across it. And you're back on the road. And that's for open for everybody. Anybody can take those steps. There's nothing else that's required other than to say, I'm lost and I'm in the wilds and I'm off the road and I need help. Jesus, will you help me? But sometimes, even after we've been pulled back on the path, we still want to wander. And guess how you get back on the path? The same way. Jesus, I'm lost in the brambles. There are thieves ahead. I'm in trouble. Help me, rescue me. And he comes and he helps us. I'm going to close by asking, asking ourselves one question. How do I know if I'm wise? And I think there's two answers here. First, are you applying what you read in God's word? Do you apply what you read? Or do you just go and you read and you hear a sermon or whatever it is that you do? And then your life is no different. Guess what? That's not wisdom. That's foolishness and a waste of time. If you're not going to apply what you read, why bother? It's a waste of time. You've got to take the word of God and ask yourself, how does this apply to my life? How does this apply to my job, my marriage, my friendships, my dating relationships? How does this apply to how I use my money? Treasuring something means taking it out, looking at it, and wanting to use it. You've got to ask yourself, how can I use this word from God? If you're not treasuring the word of God, you're probably not wise. Secondly, do you desire more of it? Remember the progression, passive reception, to actively seeking it out. As you grow in Christ, you're gonna to wanna to actively seeking it out. Do you look for people to talk about God with? Do you look for people to share your faith with? Do you look for people to engage with? Are you finding community in your connect groups and small groups throughout the church? Do your viewing habits and your listening habits change? Are you being discipled? Is there somebody that you're discipling? If you're gonna be wise, the word of God will dominate your life. And not because it's a must-have to check a box. It is a must-have because you have found that wisdom is what you need to sustain yourself. Wisdom is an absolute gift to us. And it will be your guide if you will let it. And it's not easy. It's hard. But Christ gives us the strength necessary by imparting to us the spirit of wisdom that would dwell in him, he gives to us as well. Let's pray and let's ask him for it. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for the gift that it is. May it guide each person through their life this week and bring them safely back to the community of believers that we may worship and honor you for your gifts and your person. That's in your great name we pray. Amen.